In this video we're going to train a physics informed neural network to solve the 1D Poisson problem in JAX together with the Equinox deep learning framework. For this we will first introduce the theory of pins and relate them to automatic differentiation. Then we will pick a particular right hand side and present a reference solution by finite differences together with the initial prediction of the neural network we chose. And then we can use the continuous residuum of our partial differential equation in order to iteratively update the weights of the neural network to say we train it and ultimately we will find that the trained pin produces a solution function which is very close to the reference solution by finite differences. Let's get started. Hi and welcome to this new video. Physics informed neural networks are one of these recent approaches deep learning researchers use in order to solve partial differential equations using neural networks. The idea of pins is very intuitive because it is close to what you would also do if you solved a differential equation analytically. You look for a solution function which takes as inputs your independent variables for most PDEs, these are space and time, and then outputs your dependent variables. Here in this video, I want to look at a very simple example of a 1D Poisson problem, which is given in the second derivative of the dependent variable u with respect to the independent variable x is equal to minus a forcing function. This PDE shall be living on the unit interval from 0 to 1 and we prescribe homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions so in other words the solution function at each end is forced to be zero. Here in this particular case we could actually solve this equation analytically depending on the right hand side but in general many differential equations might be unsolvable analytically. So our goal is now to find a parameterized solution, I want to call this u hat theta, which is very close to the true analytical solution of this PDE if it exists. And for this we will use the information that is given to us. So we will use the PDE, we will use the boundary conditions, and if we had a transient problem we would also use the initial condition. So in that case training physics informed neural networks is a data free problem because we only use the information that is given by the physics. We can add supervised information in a sense of measurement data or data that is given from high fidelity numerical simulations but that is optional and that is a very interesting idea. Surprisingly for many simple applications it works very well. But how can we inform the neural networks of the physics? For this we first need to talk about the architecture. So for pins one typically uses multi-layer perceptrons and these are in the form of coordinate networks. So there is no discretization of space and time. They appear continuously. As said, as you would also have it with a hypothetical analytical solution. And then we will find the parameters for this multi-layer perceptron by minimizing a loss which is given in terms of our components. So here we have a PDE residuum and a residuum for the boundary conditions. The residuum for the PDE is computed by taking our PDE and reformulating as a residuum. So we will bring the f of x or the minus f of x to the other side of the equation. So we will get second derivative of u with respect to x plus f of x. And then we will sample points on our domain from 0 to 1 and evaluate that residuum and at each point this residuum is supposed to be zero and in that sense we get a lot of points at which we have a residuum contribution and then we will compute the mean squared error over these points at which we compute the residuum. The residuum for the boundary condition in our one-dimensional problem is very easy because we can just evaluate the function at this one particular boundary point and then subtract the value it's supposed to have which is zero and then also take a mean squared error so in that sense we will just have one half times the evaluation of the network at the boundary and we have two boundary points so this is the contribution by the boundary residuum. And the idea of course is straightforward so far but we now need to express the derivative information of a network. And classical with a lot of numerical methods this is where a lot of the difficulties come in. And there are various approaches of discretizing derivatives both spatial and time derivatives. And the very interesting idea of pins is that 
Since we have a neural network, which takes as input these coordinates and maps it to the output, we can use the automatic differentiation engine of the deep learning framework, which we would already use in order to obtain a gradient estimate to also do output input differentiation. So in other words, we will take the network at these particular points and then not backpropagate into the parameter space, but backpropagate into the input space. And we do this hierarchically in that we can get higher order derivative information. So in that case, we will do it twice in order to get the second derivative. This idea of differentiating output input relations of neural networks and then using them in order to define residuum losses is an idea that goes back to the 90s. But I believe that the renaissance that we have with pins at the moment is that the automatic differentiation engines in deep learning frameworks like JAX, as we will use it here, but also TensorFlow and PyTorch are so easily accessible that you can so straightforwardly express the learning process of a pin. Okay, um, one more technical note is that if we have a PDE where the highest order is K, so here we have a second order PDE because we have a second derivative, we will need K plus one autodiff passes because once we have assembled the residuum losses, we then need to backpropagate the credit information back into the parameter space. So we will ultimately do another autodiff pass, but this time not into the input, but this time then into the parameter space. Okay, so far so good. That's the theory behind. I think it will become more clear once we code it down. We will use a reference solution by finite differences in order to check our implementation. And this is a very classical numerical method. So we will discretize the unit interval into n plus two points including the boundaries, but then we will only consider the n interior points. Our second derivative operator is approximated by a three point stencil. And this then yields a linear system of equations, which we can solve with a direct solver. And then we can plot the solution and see this solution as some sort of a reference. So and then we can judge if it has the same features of the solution. And then also let's look at the concrete scenario. So here I want to have a right hand side, which has um, a small discontinuity. So it is zero of all the domain, except from 0 0.3 to 0 0.5, where it is bumped to one. So then let's start by coding. First, I want to remove the hello world statement, and then we will import all our packages. So we will import Jax, of course. Then we will need jax.numpy as jmp. I want to import jax.random as jr. And let's import equinox as eqx. This is our deep learning framework. Then we will need optex. This is a gradient processing library and provides us with the atom optimizer. And then, of course, I want to use matplotlib.pyplotsplt for plotting. Shift enter executes the cell. Then let's define some constants. I want to use 100 degrees of freedom for the finite difference reference solution. Then I want to use 50 collocation points. These are the ones that we use to define the PDE residuum on the domain. Then I want to set the learning rate to 1 e minus 3, so 10 to the minus 3, and the number of optimization epochs. How often we want to iteratively run our update loop, and this shall be 5000. And then I also want to introduce the hyperparameter, the loss weighting. I want to call this BC loss weight 100. And I did not explain that before. So whenever we have an optimization where we have multiple components that we want to minimize. So we want the pin to both have close to zero residual of the PDE, but also prescribe the boundary conditions. In that sense, these are two goals that the pin has to fulfill. And it turns out that the loss of the PDE is a bit stronger than the one of the boundary conditions. So if we do not give it an additional nudge, it might be ignored during the training of the pin. So we will provide an additional weighting here with a factor of 100, such that those two terms are considered equally. Of course, this is a little bit of a heuristic here. Let's go down again and shift enter this cell. Then we will start with creating a random key. This is for the reproducibility. Reproducibility, and we will create the key as jrandom, so jaxrandom dot pseudo random number key. And then we will enter a seed and I want to start at seed 42. And then let's start by defining the neural architecture for our physics informed neural network. And here we will use a multi-layer perceptron. So our pin 
is a coordinate network. So a coordinate network is just a terminology that refers to something which has a continuous input and a continuous output. So in other words, we use space and time continuously and we don't have it discretized already. So we could also have a mesh which represents the geometry or the underlying domain, but we do not have that. We instead have as input the coordinate x. And this will be a coordinate network in the form of an MLP, a multi-layer perceptron, and this shall be mapping from scalar to scalar values. Because we have a scalar input, just the one-dimensional space, and a scalar output, which is this U. For Poisson problems, one can interpret this as the deformation of a membrane that is subject to a load. Okay, for this first, we will split our random key into a key and an init key. So we'll overwrite our general key by using jrandom.split the key. And then we say our pin, our physics informed neural network, is equinox dot neural network dot multi layer perceptron. And the insize of the multi layer perceptron is scalar. The outsize is also scalar. Then the width size is 10. The depth is 4. So it's a rather shallow network. And as the activation, as the activation, we will use jacks dot neural network dot sigmoid, so a sigmoid function. And then we also need to provide a key because not only do we create the architecture, we also initialize the weights. So there we will use the default initialization routines of Equinox. Let's execute that. And now we have our pin and we can now evaluate the pin at a point. So for instance, at 0 0.2, and then we will get the value 0 0.05. So in the initial state of the weights and biases of the pin, this is the output being produced, or this is what the pin thinks the solution to the Poisson problem at x equals 0 0.2 looks like. Okay, let's see how well it is in the beginning. For this, we want to create our reference solution, and we want to discretize the space into equal units, and then we can apply our finite difference method. For this, I want to first create the full mesh, so which includes the boundary points. So we say jnp dot linspace linearly spaced points between zero and one. I want to space n dot finite differences plus two points. And now we basically have a mesh, so we can also take a look at it. This is basically a collection of x positions. And we could now look at what the pin predicts at each of the points. So we could say pin called on mesh full. Okay, this raises an error. And as I just wanted to show you this here, because we defined the Equinox network to take as an input a scalar, it truly has to be a scalar. So it will not work on vectors. So the chain p lin space gives us a vector. So the pin will not operate on a vector. But we can easily resolve that by using one of the conveniences in JAX, by using JAX.vmap, a vector map, which basically turns something that operates on scalars into something that operates on vectors. And going forward, it also turns something that operates on vectors into something that operates on matrices, and so on and so forth. But now this works. So we see this is the prediction of our pin at each of the coordinate points. And you see the values look very close. So we will also see this in the plot very soon. This is a rather bad solution to the Poisson problem, but it's a very good start for our fitting process. So let's delete this for now because we don't need it anymore. So now it's time to solve the Poisson problem by finite differences. For this, I first want to get the interior mesh. This is given by taking our full mesh and then accessing it from one to minus one, which then basically includes the exterior points. Then in order to solve the finite difference problem, we also need to define our right hand side function. So this one here. So I want to define this continuously. So the right hand side function is a function which takes a coordinate input x and then returns one if we are within this interval and zero otherwise. So let's say j and p dot where if x is greater than 0 0.3 and x is smaller than 0 0.5, then return one, otherwise return zero. 
And then we can evaluate the right hand side function on the interior mesh. So this will basically give us the right hand side to our linear system except for also requiring a minus here. So basically, as you see here, bi, so the if entry of the right hand side vector is the function evaluated x at xi. So we just lack the minus now. Okay, now let's define our system matrix. For this, we first need to get the element spacing or the uniform distance between the points by saying mesh interior at one minus mesh interior at zero. And then we can build our triangular matrix by using the chainp.diag commands. So we say chainp.diag and then it takes two arguments, a vector as well as an integer specifying the diagonal we want to put it on. And the first entry we want to put is the lower diagonal, which we will fill with ones. So we will say jnp dot ones to n dot finite differences minus one. And then we will put it on the minus one, so the lower diagonal plus jnp dot diagonal jnp dot ones so, so the same vector with ones, but this time we put it on the upper diagonal and then we will put minus two on the main diagonal. So I will use minus and then jnp dot diag for diagonal and then two times jnp dot ones and this time with end of finite differences because we all want to have an end of finite difference by end of finite difference matrix. So the upper diagonal and the lower diagonal have one fewer entries. And then the main diagonal has as many entries as there are columns or rows here. Okay, so then we can put this on zero to have it at the main diagonal. And then finally, we will scale the matrix with dividing it by delta x squared. And then we have our and a difference matrix associated to our three point stencil. So this is the assembly stage. Then we can use the matrix and the right hand side to compute the finite difference solution. This is jacksnumpy dot linear algebra dot solve, which invokes a direct solver here. And then it shall solve A and minus the right hand side evaluated. And now we basically have a point wise solution of our function on the interior decrease of freedom. The boundary decrease of freedom are always fixed. These are homogeneous Dirichlet the boundary conditions. They are prescribed, so we do not have to solve for them. But in order to plot the entire solution function, we need to wrap the zero boundary conditions. And I want to write a convenience function for this that I want to call wrap boundary conditions which is a function that takes a solution vector degree of freedom u and then pads them with zeros by saying c jnp dot pad on u one one pad one in both direction and then the mode is constant which by default pads them with zero values and this coincides with our homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions. Okay well then let's plot the solutions. So first I want to plot the forcing function so we will use mesh full and then wrap boundary condition on the right hand side evaluated and then let's attach the label forcing function. Then I want to plot the finite difference solution. So plt.plot mesh full on wrap boundary condition on the finite difference solution. And then we will use the obvious label of finite difference solution. And then finally, I also want to plot the initial prediction of the pin by using meshful and then jacks.vmap on pin applied to meshful and the label I want to use initial pin solution. And then let's activate the legend. And I also want to use a crit here. Okay, let's shift enter that. Here we go. Now we have three different curves in here, the forcing function, which as you remember, we said it when the value of x is between 0 0.3 and 0 0.5, we want it to be one and zero otherwise. So this continuous peak, you can also imagine it if you have a string or a membrane, and then you only pull at this very subdomain. So put your hands there and then pull the rope upwards. And then in 
orange, we have the reference solution by the finite difference method, and this is as expected. So because we have our membrane or this string fixed at both ends due to the homogeneous Dirichlet boundary condition, it will be zero. So it respects these boundary conditions and then it will elongate and it has the strongest elongation right in the center of the force. And this is kind of as we expected here. The initial pin prediction is rather bad. It almost looks constant. So by con being constant and being non-zero constant, it violates the boundary conditions. And on top of that, of course, it looks nothing like the finite difference solution. I mean, this is kind of expected. We started with initial weights and biases of our network, but I mean, this solution is also good because it's not oscillatory and it's not very high in magnitude. So it is a good initial state of our pin or the parameters in our pin such that we can adjust them. So again, recall the ultimate goal is that our pin curve, so green here, is close to the orange curve. Okay, let's do that. First of all, I want to define the PDE residuum. PDE residuum. And this shall be a function which takes a network, so in other words, a neural network in form of an equinox model, as well as a position x. And then what does it? So recall the underlying PDE of the problem is the second derivative of u with respect to x equals minus f of x. So if we reformulate for the residual, this would be second derivative of u with respect to x plus f of x. So what we will do here is we will use the input output differentiation, which we can use by the jax crat command. So we say jax crat applied to network applied to x basically gives us the derivative of u with respect to x evaluated at the very position x. And we can do that because the implementation of the equinox models are that they are callable pie trees, or in other words, they are callable objects. So in Python, you can define classes that have a certain method, which makes them operate as functions. And applying Jack's cred to it basically gives us the derivative of this call transformation. But recall, we don't need the first derivative, we need a second derivative. So we will plug in another Jack's cred here. And so we get the cred of the cred of the network at x. And again, recall the network is a scalar to scalar map. So the derivative of it is also a scalar to scalar map. And the derivative of that is again a scalar to scalar map. So this kind of makes sense here. And then we will add the right hand side function, the forcing function, also very evaluated at x. And recall we need the plus because in the PDE we had a minus here. And if we bring it to the other side, we will get a plus. And this is already it. This is the residuum we can return. We can now evaluate the residuum by using PDE residuum of our pin, let's say for instance at 0 0.8, and then we will get this value. So it's already very low, but it is still there, so it's not zero. So the pin at this very particular point does not fulfill the underlying PDE. And we can also look at the value of the residuum at each point on our a mesh that we used for the finite difference solution by using jax.vmap on PDE residuum applied to pin and mesh interior. And then we need to specify how we want the vmap to operate. So because we cannot vectorize over pins, so we want to use one pin network on multiple interior points. And we can do that by saying in axis is non-zero. None means that we do not want to vectorize over this input and zero means we want to vectorize over this input over the zero of axis. And since the mesh interior is just a vector which has only one axis, so we want to vectorize over the vector. Shift enter then gives us a couple of values. So in essence, this is the violation of the pin at each of the points in here. And we see that there is a region here where the violation is very strong actually. And here, this is also where we see this is where the forcing function acts. So far, so good. Let's um, delete this. Now let's use this PDE residuum to build our loss function. For this, we need to specify points at which we want to evaluate the residuum. So we could use the equidistant points that we also use for our mesh of the finite difference solution, but more commonly would be to use randomly sampled collocation points. So I want to again split our key into a key and a sampling key Again, overwriting our general key by using jr split on the key. 
And then we can sample some collocation points by saying jacksrandom.uniform applied to the sampling key. And then I want to draw n collocation points in an n collocation points dimensional vector. And the minimum value shall be zero and the maximum value shall be one. But this would also include the points on the very boundary. So I only want to consider points in the interior. So I will just add a small value here. So to only sample from 0 0.001 all the way to 0 0.999. And this is just a small hack that we sample in the interior of the domain. And on top of that, I want to keep the collocation points constant throughout the optimization. This is one tweak you could add here that it's not a fixed point, but rather in each optimization iteration, you sample new points. Then we can define a loss function. So this loss function should take a network. And by network, we refer to the current state of um, the network in an optimization. So in our pin optimization, we will then read iteratively call this loss function after its transformation. So by this, we will compute losses based on the current state of the parameters in there. Okay, first we want to evaluate the PDE residuum at collocation points. This is essentially very close to what we did before. So JAX VMAP on the PDE residuum with in axes being non and zero applied to network and collocation points. And then we can get the PDE loss contribution by saying 0.5 times a JNP dot mean of JNP dot square of PDE residuum at collocation points. So then we can also define the left boundary condition residuum, which is very simple. This is just a network evaluated at zero minus zero because this is the residuum we get. So if you look at the definition here, we say u at zero is zero. And if you put zero on the other side of the equation, we have u at zero minus zero has to be zero. I mean, I think you get the point here. So let's go down. And similarly, we do the right BC residuum as network evaluated at one minus zero. So if you, for instance, wanted to use non-zero boundary conditions or non-zero Dirichlet boundary conditions, you could encode that here. Then we can get the BC residuum contribution, contribution, and this is 0 0.5 times JNP dot mean times of JNP dot square of left BC residuum. I mean, we wouldn't need the mean here because and it is just one prediction, but I will leave it here for generality plus 0 0.5 times j and p dot mean of j and p dot square of right BC residuum. And then the total loss is just so the P PDE loss contribution plus the BC loss weight multiplied with the BC residuum contribution. And then we can return the total loss. So we can, for instance, check what is the initial loss of our pin. So in our initial state, the pin has a loss of 0 0.38. So this is the starting point of our optimization. Okay, next up, we want to implement the training loop. So we will use a gradient descent based method on based on the atom optimizer. So we will use an automatic differentiation transformation on the loss function, which returns a function which not only produces a loss, but also a gradient estimate. And this is the third autodiff pass, because in here, we already have two autodiff passes based on the PDE residuum. And then we will add another autodiff pass, which goes into the parameter space. So first of all, let's define the optimizer, which shall be optex.adam. And here we can plug in our learning rate. And then we can start with an initial optimizer state by being optimizer.init applied to equinox.filter on in and then equinox is array. If that sounds a little bit strange to you, I would recommend that you watch one of the other videos with a more simpler example of training neural networks using Equinox in order to introduce you to what this filtering means here. Then I want to outsource the update step function and I want to call this make step, which takes a network and an optimizer state 
to produce a new network and a new optimizer state as well as a loss function. So for this we will first get the loss and the gradient by calling equinox.filter value and cred on the loss function and then call it on network. Okay, a lot happening here. Value and cred is another call to the automatic differentiation engine in JAX. It is just a sugar transformation with the filtering that Equinox provides here, but essentially what it will do is that it not just only produces its primal output, the loss, but also the gradient estimate. Then we can use the gradient estimate in our Optex gradient processing library using our optimizer by saying optimizer.update on gradient state and network to produce updates and new state. So it produces an update. This is basically how each of the entries in the weights and the biases of our pin shall be changed in order to get better. So we will then get a new network by saying equinox.applyUpdates on the network together with the updates. And then we can return the new network together with the new state and the loss estimate. And then our training loop is just an for loop. For this, we will also record the loss history and create an empty list for now so that we can then later on plot the optimization progress. So let's say for i or let's say for epoch in range of n optimization epochs, I want to get my pin. So I want to override this variable pin. I want to update my optimizer state. I want to get a loss estimate by make step on pin and opt state. And then I want to append to the loss history, the loss I got. And then in every 100 epoch, I want to print out the loss. So if I is divisible, or sorry, if epoch, not I, is divisible by 100, oh sorry, this should of course be zero. Then I want to print a formatted string with epoch being epoch, and loss being loss. And then before we run that, I want to annotate this make step function with at equinox.filter JIT. So essentially, this is also another sugar coated JAX transformation, a just in time compilation, such that this update function, which is the greatest computational burden in each of the update iterations, is optimized or just in time compiled. Okay, shift enter. Hopefully, this now runs. Takes a little bit for the JIT compilation. And here we see our loss print, uh, printing, and there is a bump going down. Let's plot the loss history in log scale y scale is log and there we go so here we have our iterations and that's the initial loss we started then we went down by quite a bit and then after being on a plateau for quite some time we fell down by another order of magnitude so hopefully this now produced network states that are good or provide a solution to the Poisson equation we can see that by basically rerunning the plotting so first we will plot again our reference solution by saying mesh full and then wrap boundary condition on the finite difference solution and then the label being finite difference solution and then plt.plot on mesh full and then jax.bmap on pin applied to mesh full with the label being the final pin solution or the trained pin solution would be more precise. Again, let's activate the legend and then we also activate the crit. And here we go. Now we don't have the forcing function in the same plot. That's why you also see them a bit magnified here. But nevertheless, again, the blue solution here now, be careful about the colors. So the blue solution is now our reference solution. We see it follows the homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions. So it is zero on the left and on the right boundary. And then it has its maximum elongation somewhere around here. And then we have our pin solution, which gets very close. It has a similar shape as the finite difference solution. It also respects the boundary condition, which is very nice, but it slightly overshoots here. 
And that's already it. This is the major ideas of pins. And the good thing about having these pins now is that we can first of all query them at any point, not just at these um, mesh meshes, but they are continuous and X. So we can query them at a very exotic point, like let's say for instance, 0.33, which might not necessarily be part of the discretization. So it's, I mean, this is the obvious advantage of having something which takes a continuous input. And on top of that, since we already exploited that in the in the residuum, we could also use the input output differentiation to obtain derivatives of our solution function. So for instance, the back scratch of pin applied at zero zero, we could also get its derivative at that point, and so on and so forth. So let me quickly summarize what we did. So in the beginning, we started by initializing our network and we used a multi-layer perceptron architecture, a relatively shallow network with only 10 hidden units over four depth with the sigmoid activation function. Then we showed that we cannot easily query this pin on a vector of inputs. For this, we need to vmap that. I already deleted that here. Then we defined our right-hand side function, evaluated it at the interior mesh positions, then defined the system matrix or assembled the system matrix and obtained a finite different solution by invoking a direct solver. We can pet this solution with zeros to, res to also get a full solution, including the boundary conditions, and then saw that our initial pin guess is a rather bad solution to the Poisson problem, but a good start for our training process here. We then defined the residuum, which is by en encoding the physics knowledge. So, I mean, when we talk about physics and formed neural networks, this is the physics information we give to it. It's the second derivative of the output with respect to the input, plus the right-hand side function shall be as close as possible at each point in the domain. And in order to get this at each point in the domain, we created collocation points. So some points within the domain at which we want to have the residuum being a very small number. And this is then basically averaged by taking the mean, so here, or more or less the mean squared error, so b squared before taking the mean. We also consider the boundary conditions, enforcing them by adding another loss contribution and also weighing them. Then we implemented a training loop by differentiating the loss function with respect to the network. And this is then the third auto diff pass we do here and can then iteratively update the weights and biases. We saw that our loss went down by about two orders of magnitude here and that the final solution that our pin obtains gets very close to the final different solution. Of course, there are multiple things that one can tweak here. So I already suggested that we could resample the collocation points in each iteration. We can use larger networks, which might be more capable of approximating the solution here. You could also play around with this weighting term between the boundary conditions and the PDE. Or you could also change the right-hand side function. So this discontinuous peak is a rather difficult right-hand side. You could also just start with a sine function or something like that. This channel is supported by Pasteur Labs and the Institute for Simulation Intelligence. Click the link in the video description to find out more how they merge machine learning and simulation in order to reimagine the scientific method. Also, a big thanks to all my Patreons. If you also want to support my vision of free education on advanced mathematical topics, you find the link to the Patreon page down in the video description. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then please leave a like and consider subscribing to the channel. There is more content on physics and formula networks, automatic differentiation, and in the future also operator learning, which is another interesting direction in deep learning applied to physics. Here you will now find similar videos and I hope to see you in one of the next videos.